So now we're entering the final pieces of what I wanted to include in your Intermediate 2 course. The first stop we're going to make is in convertible securities, warrants, um, more complex financial instruments. And this is a sort of introduction to these things so that when we talk about diluted EPS, which is a form of EPS that you calculate that uh, takes into effect the hypothetical effects of convertible securities, it might help bolster your intuition as to what we're adjusting for. Um, so uh, convertible securities are what we call a hybrid financial instrument because they compose characteristics of two types of instruments. The primary form is what we call what it is originally issued. So for example, if we have a convertible bond, it's originally issued in a bond, but then you can convert to a different sort of financial instrument. That ability to convert provides the conversion option and that's underlying the conversion feature. So for example, if I can convert my convertible bond into shares of common stock, bond would be the primary form, the common stock would be the conversion option feature. So this brings about a clear indecision into how we should classify the instrument. Should it be under the original conversion, uh, the primary form, the original instrument that it's uh, issued in? Should it be under the convertible form, uh, the common stock that we can convert into? Or should we attempt to measure two types a liability and an equity component and record both at the issue. Under US GAAP, uh, for preferred stock and in a lot of cases convertible bonds, we're going to record and settle that ambiguity by just recording the instrument in its primary form. So uh, for example, uh, shares of preferred convertible stock. If we issue 10,000 shares of $100 par value, six per 6% convertible preferred shares, and each one is convertible into 45 shares of $1 par value common stock. Then we would just, if we issued it at par, which is the assumption of this journal entry that they only issued at $100 each, then we would have cash of a million dollars and convertible preferred stock credited for a million dollars. Um, there would be no APIC because we issued at par, and so there was no excess of par. Um, anyway, and preferred shares can issue that way sometimes. Convertible preferred debt, for example, suppose that I issued 1,475 1,000 face value bonds that were 20 years. They're convertible. They have a stated rate of 3% and I issued them for $1,550,000 of cash. Um, so when you do the math, if this is my present value, then they issued at a 2.7486% market rate. Um, so this chapter, it's gonna be essential that you go back into your bonds notes, perhaps do a little bit of revamping on time value of money. Uh, make sure that you are proficient with using time value of money with bonds because it's going to be very important in this chapter. Um, so it'll be a good chance for you to review that stuff. In this case, um, because they're issued at 1,550 at a 2.748% market rate, we just judged the whole issue under US GAAP to be bonds, even though there's a conversion option, and then the premium makes up the difference between the amount that they issued at and the face value of those bonds. Um, we will not record a common equity component until um, we actually convert. And at that case, it'll be at, you know, converting into common stock at the par, and then we'll have some time, most of the time, a plug with my APIC common stock. So uh, let's talk about how the differences between US GAAP and IFRS can emerge. Um, under IFRS, and in some cases under US GAAP, we actually want to estimate an equity component for each convertible instrument, and then account for the sell in part as a liability and in part as equity. So this is as in opposition to how we're recording the issue of convertible securities here is all in their primary form, whereas IFRS, and as I said, sometimes we'll see under US GAAP, we make an attempt to record liability 
and equity, or we try to <clears throat> record both the primary and the conversion instruments. Right, because in these cases under a convertible bond, the liability is the primary, the equity is the conversion option. Um, when we do this, we will sometimes, IFRS typically tries to take the liability component and separate it from the conversion option. So what they do is they look at what would the bond have sold if it was more vanilla, right? If it was vanilla debt. When we're looking at that, that is the bond floor. So that is the price of the liability component alone. So let's suppose that this $1,475,000 bond issue was issued at a 4.5% market rate without the conversion option. Right. So with the conversion option, it had a 2.748% market rate. Without the conversion option, it would have issued at a 4.5% market rate, which would have changed the present value because then we would have done the calculation of the present value. We had a face value of 1,475,000. We have um, payments of Oops, forty-four thousand two hundred fifty with the three percent annual rate. We have n is equal to twenty, and then we solve for, or we don't solve for i. We saw we have i as four point five percent. Then we then solve for the present value, which in this case would equal. 1,213,101 dollars. So just using this new market rate, that market rate sets the price of the non-convertible portion of this debt. Once we have that price then, we can set up an issuance that has a discount and a face value that will give me the correct price of the the present value of the debt is remember it's a present value but also that the face value minus the discount will give me the carrying value which is equal to the present value at any point in time so then we have the debt recorded at the one million two hundred thirteen thousand one hundred one dollars by netting these two accounts here then whatever's left over is going to be the equity piece of this and so in this transaction, we receive cash for issuing a bond that has two pieces to it. And then we record some equity. That is the estimation of what amount of the sell price is contained as the conversion option because we solve for the present value when we had a market rate that was equal to 4.5 percent okay so it becomes a little bit more complicated but it also is a little bit more sophisticated of a uh, recording process because now we actually attempt to show that even though it hasn't been exercised there still is an underlying equity component to the financial instrument that was issued so we're going to look at both preferred stock and bonds how to convert them we're also going to look at warrants um, we'll probably talk about warrants a little bit in class. Uh, the video is going to focus on the conversion of preferred stock and um, the conversion of bonds. So when we're accounting for convertible preferred stock, it's slightly more straightforward than a convertible bond because we don't have two types of elements going on. We don't have a liability with an equity instrument. Um, we have uh, it, an instrument that is in its primary form equity that is preferred stock and also in its convertible form it would be common stock still equity uh, so what we want to do is record the preferred stock um, as the primary 
component. Don't record any preferred stock. I mean, I'm sorry. Don't record uh, any common stock until the exercise of convertibility actually occurs. So let's look at a company that Lord issues 100 shares of a thousand par value, 8% convertible preferred stock that pays dividends at 8%. Uh, each share was issued for 1,200 and is convertible into five shares of two par, two dollar par value common stock. So at issue, it's just going to be the 100 shares. times the issue price per share of $1,200. And that gives me the amount of cash I receive. The preferred stock is capped at par value. And then the APIC PS is everything that we get in excess of par. When the preferred holders actually go to convert then, we are going to eliminate the preferred stock and the APIC preferred stock accounts and record equity in exchange. So because each one is convertible into five shares of common stock, we have 50 preferred shares converted. If each one's becoming five shares of common stock, then we have 250 shares of common. We know that the 50 preferred stock is going to be equal to debiting preferred stock by 50,000. It was a half of the total shares we issued, but remember it's also always just going to be at par value. The amount in excess of par is just a half of the 20,000 because this represented 100 shares. 50 shares would have a pick of 10,000 associated with them. The common stock comes from the 250 shares times the $2 par. And then APIC common stock, as typically is the case, is our plug in this transaction. So with par value, I mean, I'm sorry, with preferred stock, not a huge deal. You just have to remember your rules about equity that the primary accounts, preferred stock, common stock are recorded at par value. Um, everything in APIC is in excess. Then you solve for the conversion when the par, the preferred holders actually decide to exercise their convertibility option and determine the amount of common stock that has been issued. In this case, $500 or 250 shares. Now, it could be the case that the common stock's par value is greater than the preferred stock plus APIC preferred stock. Not typically going to be the case, uh, but it could be the case. The reason why it won't typically be the case is that preferred stock has a higher par value than common stock, and so it's just likely that the common stock account is going to be a rather low credit amount uh, compared to the preferred stock account, uh, unless the one instance that it could happen in is if you have a relatively high par value for your common stock or there is an extreme amount um, of conversion or the conversion ratio is very preferable, like 100 shares of common stock per one share of preferred stock, something that would provide a lot of common stock per every one share of preferred. But again, um, not typically going to see it. If we do see it, then the accounting is going to change. We no longer need a plug. Um, we no longer need a, a credit plug because remember when we had a credit plug, it was to the APIC CS, but rather we need a debit plug and the debit plug, like most of our stock transactions is actually going to go to retained earnings. Okay, so in this example, I said, suppose that each share of preferred stock were convertible into 200 shares of common stock with a par value of $10 each. So I inflated the convertibility ratio, I inflated the par value, and so now when those 50, uh, 50 preferred shares convert, they're going to convert into 200 common shares each, which is going to be... 10,000 common shares and each one has a $10 par value. 
So that's going to be $100,000 of common stock recorded. So we record the $100,000 of common stock. Um, oops, these guys should both be slid over <laughs> because they're both debits. Um, we record the 10,000 uh, debit to APIC PS like we did before, the 50,000 debit to the preferred stock as we did before. The debit account that we need is retained earnings for 40,000. So uh, when we account for convertible bonds, that was preferred stock. Now, for convertible bonds, we switch gears a bit. It becomes a lot more complicated because we're talking about two types of underlying financial instruments, liabilities and equity. Um, some convertible bonds features allow them to settle in shares of common stock, so they just convert directly into shares of common stock. Others, um, you know, and this isn't quite as often or the case, not frequent, but they'll let you do the shares or provide an amount of cash that is equal to the fair value of the common shares they would have received. So in one case, you're just giving them shares of stock and they can continue to hold them. In the other case, you're giving them cash for the current value of the shares they would convert into. Right? Um, there are types of bonds that are convertible that are called exchangeable bonds. So this is a subset of the convertible bond world. This is where uh, a company issues a bond that is convertible into another company's shares of stock. So this could be something that would most likely be done by a brokerage or a financial institution that had a lot of equity investments in various companies. They could issue a bond that would be convertible into shares of stock that they possess, and then they would issue those shares of stock, those investments, rather than their own stock. Um, so it's going to be the same accounting up until the day of conversion, and then on the day of conversion, rather than credit common stock, we're going to credit our investment account, similar to a property dividend. We're not crediting cash because we're not paying cash. Um, so make sure that you understand that exchange and just know that what the term means. Um, and then there are, you know, what is the incentive of issuing convertible stuff? Well, in the case of convertible bonds, a lot of the idea is to get a lower rate of stated interest or a lower market rate, um, simply because the conversion feature makes the bond issue more appealing. It allows uh, the bondholder the choice of becoming a common holder, and so they won't demand quite as much in return in terms of an interest rate. Um, so what is the incentive for the convertible holder? Well, of course, they're going to want to convert when they're in the money. And they have a different way of, of being in the money than we've seen before in stock options. When they're in the money, um, the first or the way to determine is whether the conversion price is less than the market price of the stock. If it's in the money, this will be true that the price they paid to convert is going to be less than the market price that they could purchase the stock at. So for example, um, the conversion price is just going to be the face value of the bond divided by the number of shares into which it's convertible. So a $1,000 face value bond convertible into 20 shares of stock basically suggests you're buying each share of stock for $50 because you have a 1,000 face value divided by 20 shares. And so you're essentially paying $50 per share of stock. That's the conversion price. Hence, if the market is trading for $80 per share, I can exercise my conversion price, essentially spending $50, and then buy a stock, or I would have a stock that is worth 80, so I've created value of $30 per share. Um, if the conversion is in the money at issue, then we absolutely need to record an equity component at issue valued at the intrinsic value. So this is a IFRS approach in that 
what we're doing. It's one of those cases in which we split uh, the liability and the equity component. But rather than base it on the price of our liability, we're going to base it on the intrinsic value of the convertibility option. And whether it has intrinsic value, once again, is going to be based on whether it's in the money, which is its conversion price and the market price of the stock. Okay. Suppose that then, let's look at this, if it's issuing in the money, suppose Bailey has a million dollars issue, 4% 10-year convertible bonds. Each bond is convertible into 50 common shares, and they are $1,000 bonds. And so we issued 1,000 $1,000 bonds. Each one is convertible into 50 common shares. Has a stated rate of 4% and N of 10. The stock was traded at $75 on the day of issue, and the bonds were issued for 103. So when I say the bonds were issued for 103, that means that the cash price was 103% of the face value. And that's just industry jargon, um, so something to be aware of. But basically saying the issued at 103 is the same as saying we got $1,030,000 from the issue. Um, Bailey Inc. is allowed to settle the convertibility option either in shares of its common stock or cash equal to the fair value of shares on the day of conversion. So it's one of these issues, like I said, that's a little rare where we have a bond that allows you to settle in cash or shares of its uh, stock. <clears throat> so looking at this then, we would determine whether or not is it in the money. So in order to determine that, we need to have a conversion price. How much is each bondholder sacrificing to convert into a common share? Well, each bond is worth $1,000 and is convertible into 50 shares. So I'm essentially buying each share for 20 bucks. Well, since I'm buying each share for $20, now I compare that to what the fair value of the stock is. Because remember, we want to look at the conversion price to the market price of the stock. Well, since that's $20 per share, then the market price of the stock was $75. So we have an in the money conversion, a convertibility option. It's in the money by $55 because I only have to spend $20, give up a $1,000 bond to get 50 shares, and then I can turn around and sell those shares for 75 per. Well, I bought them for 20, I'm gonna sell them for 75, so that means it's in the money by 55 bucks. That's its intrinsic value. Well, since it's in the money, we have to record it by looking at the liability versus its equity component, and we are going to base our overall valuation on this equity component because we have the $55 intrinsic value. We're gonna multiply that by the 1,000 bonds that were issued because we had 1,000 $1,000 bonds, and that's gonna give me the $55,000 of equity. At that point then, we know that the bonds had a face value of a million, we would record a credit for that amount. Any amount that is left over is going to be the plug. Now this is very similar to IFRS, like I said, we're splitting it apart. However, remember IFRS based it on the liability component, we're basing this on the equity component, And the liability notice is the plug. 
right? The liability, the amount of the book value, the liability is just set by the amount of the discount I need in order to have this all balance. So let's look at an example um, where we're recording uh, a, a, an issue out of the money. Right? So if the convertible option is not in the money, so suppose the stock was trading at $15, so I just artificially set the price at 15 we saw that the conversion price, remember, was $20 which is not less than 15, which is the market price. Since that is not a true statement, then it is not in the money. So we can just record it as a vanilla bond issue at the outset, right? We record it in its primary form. We don't try to separate the equity and the liability forms. If it issued at 103, then the entire issue excess of the face would go to a premium on convertible bonds, and then we would treat it just like a convertible bond that issued at a premium until it was exercised. Okay. So that's dealing with the issue. And I know you've been itching to know, what do we do at exercise, right? Um, as if that wasn't all complicated enough. Different ways of doing it, different systems, different caveats, uh, different rules telling me to go one way than the other. Um, under US GAAP, we're going to have two methods that we can use in order to uh, show the conversion. In the book value method, we are going to use the book value of the remaining primary form to solve for APIC CS. Under the market value method, we're going to use the market price to solve for APIC CS. And we may have a gain or a loss. So let's look at the two ways of going about this. Uh, I have an example firm. Big Data is issuing 2 million face value, 6% annual interest, five-year convertible bonds. So that's the stated rate. This is the face value. And remember, we just multiply the face value by the stated rate to get the payment, which would be 120,000. Five years is our N. Each $1,000 each $1, bond is convertible into 10 shares of $1 par value common stock. Uh, suppose the market rate of the issuing firm is 7% for non-convertible debt. So if it was just straight vanilla debt we were issuing, it would be 7% market rate. And it's a 5% market rate for the convertible issue. So our stock is currently trading at $82 a share. First thing we want to do is check to see whether it is in the money. So remember, the first thing you need to do, each 1,000 bond is converted into 10 shares. So $1,000 bond divided by 10 shares is $100 per share. That is the conversion price. I have to give up $100 for every share that I'm purchasing. Is that in the money? Well, if we have the $100 conversion price and compare it to the $82 market price, it is not in the money. So we don't have to worry about recording the equity component. We just want to record in the primary form. So we're just going to record it as a debt issue until it is converted. Um, under US GAAP then, we would have cash. And in order to determine the amount of cash, we'd have to have the present value of this instrument. Remember, to get the present value then, I have an FV of 2 million PMT of 120,000. I have an N of five and an I 
if I'm going to do this under US GAAP as totally a um, debt issue, then I would record it for 5% because there is no equity component. Um, I will get all the cash I got when it is issuing at 5%, which is 2 million. $86,590. Now, if this had issued under IFRS, we'll look at that in a second to see how you would convert it. Let's finish up with the uh, gap. We would have convertible bonds at their face value. And then we would have a premium on bonds for the remaining amount, 86,590. Okay. Now with IFRS, they would try to split it. They would still receive the same amount of cash because it is a convertible instrument. It has its own market rate. Now IFRS would use that hypothetical 7% to set the bond's value. So bond at 7%, its present value is 1,917,996. So that means that this is our present value. If we want to figure out the discount, we take the face value less the discount, that'll give me that present value there. So it's a $2 million face value minus whatever the discount is to get $1,917,996. So that is an $82,000, $82,004 discount. Then I record it as I would under IFRS which is no discount, just the bonds at their discounted value. So 2 million minus that, which would be the $1,917,996. And then you have equity as the conversion option for the difference between those two. So remember, when we're doing an IFRS record, record of this issue, it's typically going to be the liability that sets it. Um, but we're going to see that under warrants, really, it's always either one, whichever one is more determinable. Um, in this case, I gave you information to determine what the liability would have been. Um, there was no underlying equity in the money option that we recorded. So I defaulted to the bonds payable. Okay. Um, at the end of the year, what would we record in interest expense? Well, then this just becomes uh, a vanilla problem under either method. You just have to use the appropriate market rates in order to solve it correctly. The US gap interest would be recorded at the carrying value of the instrument at the beginning of the period times the market rate of interest. As we've seen all along, the effective interest rate method is what it's called. Um, so we would take that $2,086,590 uh, carrying value under the case of US GAAP, multiply it by 5% in order to get the amount of interest expense that I would owe on the bond. And then the payment would 
determine how much of a premium I need to reduce here. That reduces the premium. So it is just exactly like a vanilla debt. After we've decided to classify it as debt, we adjust for the interest precisely how we would under US GAAP with the effective interest rate method. With IFRS, it too uses the effective interest rate method, but we have a different carrying value, 1,917,996, and we have a different interest rate, 7%. So IFRS would record interest expense equal to $134,258. That would be based on a cash payment of $120,000. And remember, IFRS does not use premiums and discounts. And so instead of amortizing a discount, we would credit bonds payable directly for the $14,258 difference. So both of them are similar to the way we would treat debt after we've chosen to classify it as debt. Notice that IFRS sort of leaves behind this 168,593 um, when determining interest expense and that US GAAP treats the whole thing as liability and so it carries the whole thing forward when determining interest expense. So now let's look at, now that we recorded the issue and just saw how it works mechanistically, let's talk about what happens when we actually convert. So when we convert by the book value method, um, it's typically used by most companies, we convert the common stock, um, suppose we convert all of these bonds in this example into common stock at the end of three years. So under the book method, we zero the debt accounts along with any discount or premium and then we issue new common stock at the conversion rate per bond. So in this case, we had a conversion rate of 10. Where is that? So that was 10 shares per bond. Recorded at par, APIC's going to be the plug. Like I said, under the book value method, it's just all about what the book value of my debt is. So at the end of the third year, the carrying value of these bonds is $2,037,188. You can get that really quickly by using your financial calculator. Have an FV of $2 million, have your payments of $120,000, your I is 5%, rolling under US GAAP, and then N would be changed. We now only have, if three years, if three years have passed, we only have two years remaining, which means that the present value of this is now going to be equal to what those terms suggest, which is $2,037,188. You could find it also by doing an amortization table for three years, um, just rolling forward and doing these uh, interest expense journal entries and the amortization of the premium over time, but a much more quick uh, and efficient way is to recalculate the carrying value at that point in time. So if this is the amount that the bonds are at, that means that I have my bond account at $2 million, and I have my premium account at $37,188. So that makes up this book value. In order to get rid of them, of course, then I'm going to have to debit both of them for that amount because everyone is now converting. So we zero out both of those accounts and then we record debits. Now, the amount of common stock we record is based on the convertibility ratio. Uh, remember that this would be 
two million dollars, two million bonds, two million face value bonds. Each one was worth a thousand dollars, and so we had um, two thousand bonds, two thousand individual bonds, each convertible into ten shares of common, which makes twenty thousand common shares at a $1 par value, that gives me the $20,000 there. And then APIC common stock becomes a plug. And it's a plug simply based on the book value of my convertible bonds and the par value of my common stock. That's why we call it the book value method. Now, suppose I want to use the market value method. We still zero out the debt, but the new common stock is going that we issue that we record is going to be based at the market value that the stock is trading at on the day of conversion. Um, so let's look at this. Suppose that we have debt being converted at the end of the third year when the current stock price is trading at 110. Well, remember we had 20,000 new common shares. based on that convertibility ratio. Each share is now worth $110, which means that we have $220,000 of a market value for the new shares. We still remove the face value and the premium the same way we did up here, just zero those out. But notice now this is no longer a plug based on that relationship. What it becomes then is a plug based on that market value. So, I'm sorry, that, that was miscalculation there. It's actually $2,200,000 of market value. So if it's $2,200,000 of market value, we know that the common stock, because it's 20,000 new shares, is going to be 20,000. What we have then remaining is $2,180,000 of value, and that's going to go to APIC CS. And so rather than the book value of the bond setting APIC CS, we have the market value of the stock on the day of conversion setting the value of my APIC CS. Both of these have to add up to the total market value of the new shares. Because then we're going to have um, – a bit of a difference in our values. It's not going to be totally the same, right? So we have to adjust for that for the compensa our compensation for that is having a gain or a loss. And in this case, we're going to have a loss of that slightly miscalculated. I had to change some things. $162,812. Okay. So that's the market method. Because it's no longer based on the carrying value of the book, it will have a gain or a loss. A lot of firms don't use it, but it can be used in certain situations. I want you guys to do this example. Merns uh, has five questions that follow it. The questions, you know, it's a slightly different format. It'll make you think just a little bit. Um, I want to go over this at the beginning of class on Monday. We will talk about warrants on Monday as well, but I want to nail down these convertible bonds before, and I feel like there's a lot of questions that could arise because they're, they are complicated. There's uh, some review of concepts from prior uh, intermediate one, so make sure you bring all your questions to class really focus on this chapter because it's not necessarily one of the easier ones for people to wrap their heads around. All right. Thank you.